start with an announcement. We have the opportunity to uh, move the television program to 10 o'clock on Sunday mornings, and we took that opportunity for a couple of reasons. Number one, those of you who keep up know that at 1030 we get bumped a lot. Um, it happens quite often. And the reason why that happens is because the local television station always has to acquiesce to national broadcasting. So anytime there is an NFL game in Europe, anytime there's Wimbledon or any kind of you know, sporting event, we get bumped. The reason we get bumped and not First Baptist Church is because they have a contract that supersedes ours. And so that's a long way of telling you that we always are the ones that either get bumped to 11.30 or to um, you know, a different station. So we have the opportunity to be at 10 o'clock, which I think is a better time slot because if you look at ratings, you want to follow a good program. So we will be on after Meet the Press, which is supposedly a prime uh, spot, but it also allows us to have a spot where we shouldn't get bumped as much. So I know you have family members and friends that watch the television program. Help us get that word out. I have a nice little lady the other day that I ran into, and uh, we were talking about it, and she said, are you even on anymore? And I said, yes, ma'am. She goes, well, I turned it on at 1030. If you're not on, then I assume that you know, it's been canceled or something. I said, well, just flip the channel, or sometimes it's 1130. So that tells me the message isn't always getting out when the times change. And so help us with that and let us know. It's kind of funny. I, it's kind of a side story. I ran into a lady at the nursing home, and she was working the desk, and you sign in there. Uh, and she goes, I know you. And I said, yes, ma'am. She goes, I watch you on television every Sunday. I said, well, thank you. I, I, I hope you'll come and visit with us sometime. And she goes, Quit moving your arm so much. <laughs> and I said, I had my hands in my pocket, and I said, okay. And she goes, yeah, like that. Leave them like that. <laughs> and I said, okay. School is back in session, and you are getting credit for this. It may not go on your transcript, but you're getting credit for being here uh, and listening to these lessons. Hopefully you know that. We're talking about some of the basics, and tonight we're looking at the most important question. And it reminds me of a story of a little boy named Johnny who he and his sister were going to spend the summer with their grandparents who lived out on a farm. And so they get there, and Johnny had just gotten a new slingshot. And he was so excited to use it. And he gets out of the car before it even really comes to a complete stop, and he starts shooting at stuff. And he's got his stones, and he's firing them with his slingshot at all different targets, but he doesn't hit anything. And he's starting to get real discouraged. And as he heads back to the house, slumped over, his head down, discouraged, he sees his grandmother's pet duck. And without thinking, he pulls out a stone and he fires it in the direction of the duck and he hits it square on the head and kills it. At first, he's joyful, he's elated, but then he realizes what he has done and knows that he has to cover up his tracks. And so he takes the dead duck, he puts it in the wood pile and covers it up, and he goes inside. And he goes inside and he hears his grandmother telling his little sister, I need you to help me set the table. And she says, but little Johnny said he wanted to set the table. And he goes, what are you talking about? I never said that. And she looks at him. She goes, I know what you did. <laughs> and so he immediately starts setting the table. A little time goes by and she says, I need help clearing the table and washing the dishes. And, you know, the grandmother tells the little sister that. And she goes, I think Johnny said he wanted to clear the table. And, 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 and clean the dishes, and, and she looks at him, and she whispers again, I, I know what you did. And so he cleans the table, cleans the dishes. This goes on for quite some time until finally little Johnny has had enough. I mean, he's just going to have to come clean. He's tired of this. And so he tells his grandmother, he says, Grandma, I've got something to tell you, and I know you're going to be upset, but I've got to get it off my chest. He said, I killed your pet duck with my slingshot. And she goes, I know. He goes, you know? And she said, yes. He said, well, why didn't you say anything? And because she said, I wanted to see how long you would be a slave to your sister. <laughs> and it brings into focus that, that all of us are a slave to something. And there's really only two options. Either we are a slave of the devil or we're a slave of the master who is Jesus. And that's really the only two options that we have. What's it like to serve the master that is Satan? Well, turn with me to Exodus chapter 5. And in Exodus chapter 5, beginning in verse 6, here is what we read. 
Very familiar story. It says, So the same day Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters over the people and their foremen, saying, You are no longer to give the people straw to make brick as previously. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. But the quota of bricks which they are making previously, you shall impose on them. You are not to reduce any of it. Because they are lazy, therefore they cry out, Let us go and sacrifice to our God. Let the labor be heavier on the men, and let them work at it, so that they will pay no attention to false words. So the taskmasters of the people and their foremen went out and spoke to the people, saying, Thus says Pharaoh, I am not going to give you any straw. You go and get straw for yourselves wherever you can find it, but none of your labor will be reduced. So the people scattered through all the land of Egypt to gather stubble for straw. The taskmasters pressed them, saying, Complete your work, quota, your daily amount, just as when you had straw. Moreover, the foremen of the sons of Israel, whom Pharaoh's taskmasters had set over them, were beaten and were asked, Why have you not completed your required amount either yesterday or today in making brick as previously? You know that the reason Pharaoh commanded that the people do hard labor is because they were multiplying. What if the people grew so big that they decided that they were more powerful than Pharaoh and his army, and they revolted? Pharaoh lived in fear of this. And so he put them doing back-breaking labor to keep them under submission and in slavery so that they wouldn't be able to revolt and so that, hopefully, they would diminish, they would die out. He even decided that they would not provide the straw anymore, but they would have to collect the straw and make the bricks, but still come up with the same quota every day. Can you imagine working in the hot Egyptian sun with these foremen standing over you with a whip, whipping you, punishing you for not keeping up? That's what it's like to serve Satan. He stands there over us with the bull whip. Of, of, of oppression and, and submitting to him and his, his demands. And all the things that come along with that, the back-breaking sin, and the consequences thereof. You know, it looks appealing in the beginning. You would think that this would be something that would be fun and, and, and enjoyable, but it ends in a variety of ways that are all bad. It ends in a broken life, maybe a broken marriage, maybe a broken family, maybe suicide, depression. There is always a price to pay by putting yourself under the submission of Satan. But then you have a master that says this, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This master loves us. This master wants what is best for us. He is not some tyrannical dictator. No, in fact, he says, be free. He wants to save us. He wants, to en wants us to enjoy the peace that surpasses all comprehension. Why? Because because he wants what's best for us. He loves us. Why would anyone deliberately choose to be a slave to Satan when they could be a slave to Christ? Well, look with me at Romans chapter 6 now, beginning in verse 16. Paul writes, Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death, or of obedience resulting in righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. Paul is speaking to Christians who had made a transition. They had transferred their allegiance. They were now no longer under the dictatorship or the slavery of Satan. But now they had submitted to Christ, and it had brought them a new life. They were slaves of righteousness, which is a type of slavery that brings freedom, not the type of slavery that brings death. And so the natural question becomes, how do I make this transition? Well, we start in verse 17 of what Paul writes. He says, but thanks be to God. I mean, that's where we start. Thank you, God, that you even provided a way for us 
to serve a master that gives us life and freedom. Thanks be to God. Then he says, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. I want you to notice that he says that form of teaching. The New King James says that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. He doesn't say those forms of teaching or those forms of doctrine. There wasn't a variety. There wasn't a plurality of them. There was only one. Paul says, that's what you submit to. That one form of teaching, that one form of doctrine. That's how you arrive at the point of salvation. They became obedient in heart to that form of doctrine. And Paul is clear that that's just one teaching. Not one among many. Now why is this important? Because all too often nowadays, people garner the impression that any old doctrine will do, that one is no better really than the other. How many times have you heard it? It doesn't really matter what you believe as long as you believe in something. We're all going to the same place anyway. Some believe that baptism is essential for salvation. Some believe it's important, but it's not essential. Some would say all you have to do is recite this prayer and let Jesus into your heart. Some say that all you have to do is go on a pilgrimage and maintain some sort of scrupulous diet. Some say you don't have to do anything, that God determines who is saved and who is lost from the very beginning before you were even born, and there's nothing you can do about it. In a sea of ideas as to what it means to be saved, who can you trust? What is right? Many times in the New Testament scriptures, we see people asking a question, and the question they ask is, what must I do to be saved? The rich man came to Jesus, as we talked about this morning. He says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? The Philippian jailer says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Paul asked, what shall I do, Lord? In Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, after hearing that soul-stirring sermon that Peter gave, being pricked to the heart, they say, brethren, what must we do to be saved? It's the most important question anyone could ever ask. The most important question. It's vital that we answer it precisely, that we get it exactly right. We can't afford to mess this up. Never has a question carried so much weight, and never has a question required such a precise answer. I've got friends, and I'm sure you do too, that maybe don't go to church, but they have some religious beliefs. I have friends who are Hindu, some who are Buddhist, and they are very good people in a lot of ways. I know of friends that go to other churches that teach some really good things. And I have friends like you do that say things like, you know what, we're not all that different. In fact, we're probably more alike than we are different. And I say, you know what, you are exactly right. We probably believe more of the same things than, than things that we don't believe, right? We agree on more than we differ on. But many times, the one or two things we disagree on are absolute deal breakers. They are. Because when you think about it, a lot of times, the one thing even that we disagree on is the answer to this question. What must I do to be saved? And if we disagree on that, that means everything. Because everything eternal depends on how we answer that question. Again, let's, let's not look at this as pitting one religion against another. Let's just look at this from an honest biblical perspective. What's the answer to that question? What must I do to be saved is the most important question we could ever ask. And consider how this question is answered in Scripture. When the rich young ruler comes to Jesus and he asks, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What does Jesus tell him? Well, you know the commandments. And he says, yes, I've kept these from my youth up. And Jesus says, well, then one thing you lack. Go and sell off everything you own, give it to the poor, and then come and follow me. There's an answer right there. When the Philippian jailer asked the apostles, they replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him together with all those who were in his house. And they took him at that very hour of the night and washed their wounds. And immediately he was baptized, he and all his household. When Paul, who was Saul at the time, asked, what shall I do, Lord? He was told to get up and go into Damascus. And there you will be told of all that has been appointed for you to do. 
and he arrives at Damascus. He's introduced to a man named Ananias who says to him, Now why do you delay? Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. And in Acts 2.38, Peter answers the question, Brethren, what shall we do with the words, Repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins? What do you notice about all those responses? <laughs> They're all different. Which one's right? What am I supposed to do when somebody asks, what do I have to do to be saved? Do I tell them you need to go sell off everything you own, give it to the poor, and then come and follow Jesus? Do I tell them that, that you just need to believe and that's all you really have to do? I mean, what, what do I tell them? Well, if nothing else, what this shows us is there's not one specific answer, right? From this, from this viewpoint. There's not one thing that I can say and that eliminate all other responses. And yet we do that all the time, don't we? In the religious world, we do it all the time. What must I do to be saved? Well, you just got to believe. Okay, but this person over here tells me that all I have to do is confess. Well, yeah, that too. Or somebody else might say that you just have to repent. But the Bible also tells me that I have to be baptized. What about that? Oh, no, you don't have to do that. So what is it? If nothing else, the different responses to the question shows us that this is a holistic approach. The answer has to be a holistic approach, not a piecemeal approach. Because the Bible shows us that there is a way to respond to this question, and it's holistic in nature. You see, here's what we have. Nowhere does Peter mention in answering the question in Acts that you have to sell off everything you own and give it to the poor. We also have times where we see that belief is really the only answer given. Does that exclude baptism? Does that exclude repentance? There is a holistic approach here that we have to consider the biblical evidence. And we cannot proof text our way through salvation and take out of context the verses or the passages that better suit our agenda. Another thing we learn from these passages is that there is something that you have to do. I often hear people say that God is solely responsible for man's salvation and there is nothing that man can do whatsoever. But we're going to talk about in a few weeks that receiving the gift of salvation doesn't mean that you're required to do nothing. And by doing something, it doesn't mean that you are trying to earn it in any way whatsoever. The Bible is very clear that you have to do something. I mean, have you noticed how the first century folks didn't seem to have a problem with doing anything? That didn't seem to be a, a, a qualm for them. I mean, every time they asked, what must we do? What, was, what, must we do? What, what shall I do to be saved? They understood that doing was a part of it. Whether it's believe, whether it's repentance, whether it's confessing, being baptized, living faithfully. The Bible shows us that there is a definite answer. And we must accept the whole of that answer. And not just one part of it. Sometimes we can answer a good question with a good answer, but maybe not the best answer. You believe that? Sometimes we can answer a question, and we can answer it in a good way, but maybe not the best way. For instance, if someone were to ask me, Chris, who do you think is going to win the game tonight? I'd say, well, the team that scores the most points. That is a good answer. It's a right answer, because the team that scores the most points is always going to win. But the person asking me that question more than likely wanted a better answer, right? They wanted to know who I would think was going to win and why. Maybe give them some commentary as to why I think that they're going to win. And sometimes in the Lord's Church, we can answer this really good question with a good answer, but maybe not the best answer. Stick with me on this. You know, oftentimes, how we answer the question, what must I do to be saved, is with the plan of salvation or the scheme of redemption, right? Right? Actually, did you know that a guy by the name of Walter Scott, who was a restoration preacher, is credited with coming up with six steps to salvation? He said, man provides faith, repentance, and baptism. 
And God provides remission of sins, the gift of the Holy Spirit, and eternal life. Those were later cut down to five steps so that they would fit on our fingers. So that we could do it by just using our hand. That should tell you something, right? That we revised it so that it would fit on our hand. But if we look at the five steps, oftentimes what happens is we present something that's not biblical. And it's not that we're trying to do that. Certainly, we would never think about doing that intentionally. But there's some unintended consequences. And I hope that you stay with me on this. Please don't tune me out because I, I'm not suggesting that these steps are not in the Bible. Not by any means. They are biblical. And if you use that plan, then, then good for you. At least you're doing something, right? But think about this with me, and you don't have to agree with me, but just think with me for a moment. Sadly, this teaching sometimes leaves people with the impression that salvation is a checklist item. That you just go through the steps and you check them off as you go. Believe, got it. Repent, got it. Confess, got it. Baptism, okay, got that. And as I've said over and over again, you're probably getting tired of me beating that dead horse, is the fact that we're not called to baptize people. We're called first and foremost to go and make what? disciples. Baptism is included in the disciple-making process. In fact, it is essential. You don't have a disciple without baptism, but that's not the only thing involved in making a disciple. And so the goal is not to rush people through steps and get them to check them off. The goal is to make a disciple. God didn't send a checklist. He sent a Savior. And sometimes there's an unintended consequence here that we leave people with the idea that the gospel is some sort of checklist. Also, we have to be careful in our presentation of the gospel not to share inaccurate information. And that is what we do when we treat the gospel plan as steps, because they're not steps. Now, I know that's what's easy for us, and that's what we have used as a diagram, as these steps that lead upward to heaven, and you have belief, you have repentance, you have confession, you have baptism, and then you have living faithfully, or, you know, it was here, obey, you know, all those kind of things. These aren't steps. And the Bible nowhere treats them as steps. Because when you treat them as steps, it sounds like I start down here at belief. Okay, I've, I've, I've got belief. Now I move on. Now I'm at repentance. Okay, got that one. Now I move on to confession. What's the problem there? Do you ever stop believing? Is that a step you leave? No. You are to believe the rest of your life. You have faith the rest of your life. Repentance is something that is ongoing. As long as you live. As long as you live, you will confess Jesus. That's not a one-time commitment that you make by words before you get baptized. You confess Jesus continually the rest of your life. Baptism is the only one that truly can be called a step, right? Because when it's engaged in properly, it's a one-time deal. But the other three are not steps. And it's not like we're climbing or ascending these stairs, leaving one behind as we go on to another. That's not accurate. And so we've got to be accurate. Obedience to the gospel is a lifestyle. And our confidence in salvation has nothing to do with reaching the top of a staircase. It has nothing to do with checking, list off of our, or checking things off of our item list. It has everything to do with our response to God's gift of grace. We've got to be careful here. The Bible never presents salvation as a staircase that people have to climb. To present the gospel in this way means that we may never get people to understand what it properly means to be a disciple. There are a lot of important questions. And there are a lot of important questions that require an answer, right? I mean, people ask the question, the existential question of, you know, why am I here? What is my purpose? I mean, those are important questions. You have questions that are important to you. I have questions that are important to me. Like, why when you go into a bank do they leave the vault wide open, but they chain the pins to the counter, right? Why did kamikaze pilots wear helmets? Was that necessary? I mean, these are... These are questions that baffle us. We have important questions, but none of them are more important than what must I do to be saved. That is the absolute most important 
question we could ever ask. And we've got to answer it precisely, faithfully. We've got to know how to answer that question for people. For our own sake, but I'm trusting that many of you in here have already answered that question in your own life, we've got to be able to answer it for other people as well. And again, I I hope you understand where I'm coming from. I'm not trying to suggest that five steps is is bad. But we've got to be careful in how we present it. We are trying to make disciples. And it doesn't matter what your grandmother taught you. It doesn't matter what you learned from the Bible class teacher or the preacher. Is the answer they're giving you a biblical answer? Hopefully it is. Hopefully it is. But if it's not, then you've got to turn your back on that answer and go to the right answer. And I say that because I have studied with folks, and maybe you have as well, that knew what they needed to do. They saw very clearly what the Bible presents as the answer to that question, but it Something was holding them back. They couldn't make that decision to go forward because it would hurt their family relationship. They're more devoted to a denomination than they are to the Word of God, whatever it may be. We've got to answer this question correctly and accurately. And it doesn't matter what anyone else has answered to that question, what anyone else has said, we've got to be able to answer it from God's word because that's the only standard that matters, right? That's the only answer that truly matters. I want to leave you with, with the words in Acts chapter 22 and verse 16. Ananias says to Paul, Now why do you delay? Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. Maybe you need to do that. I ask you the same thing. Why do you delay? Why are you waiting? This is the most important decision you could ever make in your life. Don't put it off. And let's be ready to answer this question precisely and accurately from Scripture when we go out in the world tonight and in this week. Let's be able to tell people what it means to be saved. What is the answer to that question? And let's live it every day of our life. So if you have a need tonight that we can help you with, Clyde's going to lead a song. Come forward now as we stand and as we sing.